FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is March 28th, 2017, almost at the end of the first quarter. And we're approaching uh, the first hundred days of the nascent Trump administration. So much going on and figured we'd get the perspective from the other side of the pond. And we've got Alistair McLeod with us now of Gold Money. Alistair, welcome back. It's very much my pleasure, Kerry. Hey, so <laughs> I wrote an article about uh, Trump, the workaholic in chief. Basically, he's burning out the media because they're, you know, the media, they're basically lazy people that can't wait to get out the door and hit the local watering hole and, and really start to work. Right. Uh, You're making me sympathize with them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, a story could break out any minute with a tweet and not that you need tweets for, uh, for all the news that's been happening lately. Right. I mean, you got your share of news over there as well. Well, yes. I mean, it's it's um, certain, uh, we've got um, uh, Brexit will be triggered tomorrow. That's um, Article 50, under which notice is served that we're leaving. And it starts a two year process whereby we negotiate the terms of our leaving, as it were. Um, and of course, we've had uh, a terrorist attack, which I mean, I think we've been very lucky not to have had more of those. Um, yeah. And it's a bit frightening that anyone who is an extremist behind the the uh, steering wheel of a car can just go and wipe people out. Um, that is rather worrying. And we just hope there won't be t any more sort of copycat uh, instances of that. But uh, certainly, um, I think the security services are on high alert. But it's very difficult for them to stop that sort of thing, I fear. Hey, there's a fine line between a uh, terrorist behind the wheel and at least in Florida, a an 80 year old who can't barely see over the wheel and uh, who has diminished vision and reflexes. I mean, it's hard to tell the difference. <laughs> You know, well, the only thing I can say is that um, I think the elderly parties in Florida don't drive along the pavement at 70 miles an hour. They might drive along the pavement at <laughs> 30 miles an hour, but not 70. But sometimes, you know, they mistake the gas pedal for the brake pedal and then all yeah. bets are off, Alistair. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, yeah, you can't. We've known for a long time that you can't really uh, prevent the majority of these attacks, but so many of them, Alistair, they know these people, they've talked to these people, they've monitored, surveilled them, and even taken away their guns, like here in the United States, only to give them back again, like that chap who shot up uh, Fort Lauderdale Airport. I mean, they know them, and yet they're powerless to do a thing about them. It's just yeah. remarkable. Yeah, it's difficult. Anyway. So, but uh, onto financial terror, <laughs> that's kind of our realm here. Uh, yeah. You know, there's nothing going on in the world to, to make you feel a little bit sanguine or uh, reassured that the powers that be actually know what they're doing and are actually uh, on the case. Is there? Well, that's right. I mean, I've known for a long time they don't know what they're doing. Um, what I haven't been sure about is whether they're in control of events, which are two rather separate things. I'm beginning to suspect they're not in control of events. And I think this has been shown up, if you like, by uh, uh, your President Trump's experience uh, with um, uh, the Republican Party in Congress over Obamacare, um, trying to repeal that. Mm. And suddenly, um, you know, we're sitting here thinking, my goodness, uh, is he going to be able to get any of the tax cuts through? What, how, how, is the, how is this going to fit into the budget deficit? Um, and hold on a minute, uh, we're up against the, the lending ceiling or the borrowing ceiling, whatever you like to call it, of mm. around about 19, 20 trillion. And that, um, the suspension of that was lifted, so they can't go and borrow any more money, as I understand it, until such time as uh, President Trump um, can set a figure and get the agreement of Congress. So, mm. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I was looking at an article on Zero Hedge this morning that was saying that it's quite possible that government is going to be shutting down from the end of April. So, you know, it's, it's, um, interesting to say the least. Yeah. Well, I think 
uh, I don't want to call myself a Trump supporter. That's a little too extreme. Uh, I think we were faced with a lot of bad choices or a lot of impossible choices uh, in this election. And he was the time will tell. But point is uh, (laughs) the corruption and what's happened to the U.S. government here is just stupendous. I mean, they're completely unfit to lead any of them in the Congress. I'm always uh, reminded of uh, Will Rogers' old statement, I'm not a member of any organized political party, I'm a Democrat. Well, now that could apply to the Republicans as well. And the demise of the parties, I always felt that they should have just been out and out banned, outlawed, because political parties do far more harm than good. And we wouldn't have uh, anywhere near the problems in the world that we have if there were no political parties. I don't know how you go about banning them. I mean, we do have First Amendment here, but I think if the Founding Fathers knew what was going to happen, they would have outlawed political parties on their own. I think your Founding Fathers knew what was going to happen, which is why they wrote the Constitution the way they did. I mean, Mm -hmm. basically, since then, it has been progressively ignored. At least that's, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in these matters, but that's what it seems to me. Yeah, honored more in the breach than the performance, if you will. So, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, but, you know, we're to the point now where basically if they can't start doing their jobs, we're ripe for a dictatorship. It's just going to happen here. There, there's no question about it because somebody is going to have to act. And if it can't, if they can't act in accordance with the Constitution, then they're going to act outside the Constitution and, and Trump will do it. And whether there'll be an event that gives him the right to seize the reins of power, that's what I always thought Obama was going to do. I thought that's what it was all leading up to. Uh, But that's my guess, is somehow, somewhere, there will be an event that causes him to basically just take over the show. And for better or for worse, I mean, right, all the republics uh, have a limited shelf life, and then they devolve into dictatorships. Well, I think there's a problem with that, and that is that, um, well, what we call the deep state um, is definitely anti-Trump. Yeah. And uh, um, I think that they will not permit that to happen. Um, I don't know there's a lot they can do about it other than engineer events uh, that undermine his position. And I think they've certainly been trying to do that uh, over his uh, alleged contacts with Russia, which (laughs) seemed to me to be more in the mind than in in truth. But I think you're right, Kerry. I mean, basically what we're seeing um, is, um, you know, what Hayek wrote about in his Road to Serfdom. It's a very progressive drift away from personal freedom. into less freedom, greater taxation, surveillance. Um, and every time you get a terrorist event or something like that, it's an excuse for yet greater surveillance. We're seeing that over here. Um, it's been with you for some considerable time because what's now coming out through WikiLeaks is the most enormous um, uh, control that uh, your uh, intelligence services seem to have over um, electronic media of different sorts. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> there's even sort of fears that uh, they'll be able to turn your fridge on and off. So, okay. Well, I wrote a, a anything which is controlled <laughs> by the internet. Is, <laughs> I wrote a tongue-in-cheek uh, article a while back. If I didn't, I should have. Is that uh, could your refrigerator refrigerator wind up testifying against you in court? You know, <laughs> or your washing machine, or who knows what appliance, your television set. Uh, they're all set to uh, spill the beans on you, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, all, <laughs> all all in record mode. Yeah. <laughs> So hey, all I know is there was a picture of our erstwhile FBI director, James Comey, at his desk. And at his computer, he had a piece of tape over the camera. Now, if the FBI director has a piece of tape over his webcam, what does that tell you? <laughs> right? I mean, what, what are you supposed to conclude from that? Well, ex- exactly. It tells me that the reason that I have a tape over mine um, <laughs> is fully justified. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I don't overmine. I mean, it's in an office. I don't really spend any time here in the office other than when I am actually working. And at that point, I'm recording anyway. So they get a video of me doing whatever I'm doing. But but it's probably not a bad idea. Sometimes I point it up at the ceiling 
uh, yeah, it's uh, it is a cause for concern. And you know that, like you said, these people are clueless, but they sure do collect a lot of data. Uh, they do in the process of being clueless, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I think I think our only um, defense, or sorry, our, the only benefit, if you like, is they're collecting so much data that they can't possibly sift through it yeah. all. <laughs> Except yeah. what they do is they search for keywords. So you've got to learn what the keywords are and just don't use them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, you look at it and it's 1984, but 1984 far worse in many ways than you could ever believe 1984 could get. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. I mean, that, to me, that was the most depressing book and the movie was even, or movies, but I only saw the latest one. The movies were even worse than the book. And, you know, you look at it and just, and you think, gee, Orwell was an optimist. <laughs> yes. Oh, I know. I know. So, oh, well, also, I mean, one of the things that's, that um, we want to know over here, which is very relevant to us, is what is President Trump's uh, policy going to be on trade? Yeah, good question there. Um, I mean, he talks a good game of, uh, of economic nationalism. Uh, but in reality, look, if we shut down the borders of products, but hey, we have a special relationship, so don't worry about it, Britain. Right? Great Britain doesn't have to worry. The UK is safe. But, but Harry, thank you for your reassuring words. I'm still worrying. I'm still worrying. <laughs> but, but look, and, and France doesn't have to worry because... The only thing we get from them are cheese and wine, and I think we get some butter from them. I just bought some French butter the other day and other delicacies. So yeah, but well, uh, <laughs> obviously, the, 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 unfortunately, there's going to be a bit of inflation in the um, in the Lutz household by the sound <laughs> of it when, when various import duties are put on French butter and cheese and all those <laughs> other lovely things. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt, but. Uh, what I was going to say is in practice, we're too far integrated to do all these things. I remember I bought my stepson an American car, and this is in 2008, a Ford Edge, good American brand, right? And I looked at the yep. sticker because you have this domestic content requirement on the car stickers, and it was 70% American products at that time. And who knows what it really was, but that's what they admitted to. Now, however, who knows what the real domestic content of that vehicle is? It could be well under 50% with all of the offshoring to Mexico. So yep. I don't think it's really practical for a lot of the things that he said. But I think that deregulation and reforming of the tax code, which I do believe will happen in one form or another, will, uh, will make it more advantageous for companies to bring uh, to bring operations back well there's two other factors a surplus of water in the united states and the uh, relative cheapness of energy uh, we know that energy is especially nat gas is e extremely favorable price differential and there's a lot of industries where energy is the second highest component after labor and yep. uh, capital so you know i don't think that uh, that China has to worry about shutting down quite yet. But I think a redefinition of a lot of the relationships that are really inherently wrong. Uh, the U.S. is the only country that doesn't have a border adjustment tax under the, under the World Trade Organization, things like that. You know, he's going to uh, he's going to attempt to change it, whether he's successful or not. Well, the U.S. is the biggest debtor nation in the in the world and in history, so we'll have to see. But <laughs> I think well, there is a. I mean, I the thing that worries me um, is that nobody seems to realise what the origin of trade deficits um, is, and it's really quite simple. The origin of trade deficits is unsound money. Mm -hmm. um, I can explain it this way. Uh, just imagine sound money. Um, let's assume that the only money in the country is gold and the only money that can be traded with other countries is gold. Now, under those circumstances, um, if, you, if you're going to go and buy some French wine, you have to pay for it in gold or someone else has to pay for it in gold by exporting something to France for value, for mm. gold value. So you can never actually have a trade surplus or a trade deficit under sound money. 
Now we have unsound money. So what that tells us is that when you get a persistent deficit, it must be because there is a differential in the rate of expansion of bank credit between two trading nations. And um, so, and part of that is if you get a budget deficit, then this is how the twin deficits arise, because out of a budget deficit, that's financed by unsound money, usually, uh, and uh, that feeds into uh, a trade a trade deficit at the same time. And hence the, the twin deficit phenomenon, which um, people first really started observing back in the 1980s. So if you want to get a balance of trade, you do not do it by imposing taxes, um, by devaluing your currency to try and make your um, product more um, cost effective abroad or more commercial abroad. Um, no, I mean, the only way in which you balance your books is to make sure that the government balances books and uh, that uh, governments and that banks do not um, create bank credit. But I'm afraid that's not the world we live in. No. Um, so what I mean, the world we live in has got these trade deficits. We now know from the explanation I've given you, and I hope your listeners understand it, uh, what the source of these trade deficits uh, is. And therefore, I'm afraid we're going to continue to have trade deficits. So whatever uh, President Trump does on the trade fund is not going to change that at all. Um, and his call for a competitive, um, well, he didn't call for a devaluation of the dollar, rather he <laughs> called for a revaluation of the euro upwards upwards and the Japanese yen and mm -hmm. tells us that the Chinese have been um, suppressing their currency, which they haven't. Um, but really, put another way, what he wants to do is see the dollar down. Uh, and he thinks that that will sort out the imbalances. I'm sorry, it won't. No. Well, you're kind of advocating a system that we had in the late 1800s and 1870s. And that was a period of uh, time where we had unheralded prosperity and peace. And uh, I only wish it could happen, but, you know, the odds of that, just it's just not going to happen here. So we know that. But, uh, yeah, because when you've got these currencies, if they were all allowed to float and find their true value, perhaps uh, freely floating uh, currencies could work. But uh, when you have all these pegs and everything else, you just it just can't work. It can't yeah. work in the uh, long run. It's not going to. Um, I don't see. I don't see um, freely fo floating currencies actually resolving the problem because um, mm -hmm. the problem comes from the relative expansion of bank credit between mm -hmm. one country and another, as I've just said. Um, and uh, you you can find that the currency rate fluctuates. It does not necessarily fluctuate in accordance with the expansion of bank credit. Um, mm -hmm. It fluctuates, if you like, on uh, the market valuation or the valuations that's placed on it on, um, in the market. Yes. Um, now, if you look, for example, at the at the euro, um, you've got two things to consider there. One is that uh, the euro region is in a moderate trade surplus, thanks mainly to Germany by the way. Right. Uh, and um, cons consequently, um, that would tend to push the euro up. However, in financial markets, you could argue that there's growing concern about the financial stability and the systemic risk that is building up within the eurozone. And therefore, you would not want to hold unnecessary euros. So that is a reason to sell it. Uh, so you can see immediately that uh, the, the idea that the euro would reflect um, uh, the trade position uh, is it, it, it cannot be true because there are other things involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, this is why I insist on going back to, uh, you know, the, the, the sound money example, uh, which I've just sort of laid out, uh, tells us exactly why trade deficits arise. And therefore, the only way in which trade deficits can actually be cured. But as I said, uh, and I repeat, this is not the world we live in. And um, uh, it will change, I think, one day, but it's crisis first, solution second, not the other way around. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, and, and the fact is, uh, yeah, the system... We've always had an international system until it breaks down, and then they come up with a bootstrap solution and keep that going until that breaks down. And that's uh, that's the nature of the beast here, right? Yeah, I mean that's indeed. that's the way it's always worked. So so I guess uh, maybe what we're seeing now in precious metals, Bitcoin starting to uh, starting to recognize that. 
I think, um, yeah, basically uh, gold, if we, if we just talk about gold for a moment, uh, gold was going ahead quite nicely until President Trump won the election. Then it had a big jump on the uncertainty and then it came kettling off. But actually, it was just the other side of the dollar trade. I mean, if you think um, from a hedge fund manager's point of view, how am I going to play the dollar? The only way you do it is by taking an opposite position in gold. So um, following uh, the uh, President Trump's um, election, uh, the dollar was was very, very strong. Uh, then doubt started creeping in and it started coming off the top. And it was at that point that gold started running again. Um, and now we're in a situation where where's the dollar going? My guess is the dollar's got quite a bit further down to go. If that is the case, then for that reason, I think we can say that gold is pretty well underwritten and will continue to move up. Not because of there's any merit in gold, but because it is the other side of the dollar trade. There will come a point, however, uh, where if things do deteriorate in, um, in, in, in America from the point of view of the economy or, the, or inflation, um, and the stagflation thing actually looks like a, a very serious possibility. Uh, but also, if we get um, uh, developing concerns over uh, the, the overall financial position and the creditworthiness of America, then gold, I think, will take on, um, if you like, a, a slightly independent life from uh, the dollar uh, itself. And I could see gold rising quite significantly under those circumstances. We're not doing that yet. At the moment, all it is doing is reflecting the reverse performance of the dollar. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. And all this time for the past five years, it's kind of, uh, I guess, been under pressure as a result of uh, the dollar's strength, unanticipated strength. So you think the short, the big short uh, in the dollar is unwinding now? Is that what's really happening? Well, I think um, I think what we're going to be seeing is um, a, a big short going on the dollar. I think there are so many dollars around. When you look at the amount of debt, the other side of that debt is deposits. Those deposits in the form of uh, checking accounts and savings accounts and all the rest of it, you can see it all, all there in the American banking system. It is bigger than it has ever been before. And people who tell me oh, there's a shortage of dollars, there is a shortage of dollars in some places but not in other places. Mm. Uh, consequently, um, once those dollars start uh, mobilizing away from um, US treasuries, for example, because who knows, it could be that US treasuries are, should not ever, you know, should not be regarded as uh, the least risky investment uh, 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 um, in, in future. Yeah. And if, if you start getting people thinking like that, then uh, all hell can break loose. And so one way or another, I would certainly see gold as being a safe haven. Um, and I, I also see a, a lot of inflation potential, unfortunately, uh, in America, even though the US economy seems to be showing very early signs of stalling. If you look at uh, bank credit, which is beginning to contract, or has been contracting recently, there is an argument that says that uh, the US economy is stalling. And if the US economy is stalling, yet China is driving up raw material prices because of its plans to expand throughout Asia, then you're getting going to get the worst of both worlds, I think. You're going to get rising prices. And at the same time, you're going to get a stagnating economy, hence the stagflation. And uh, what can the Fed do about it? Raise interest rates? Well, no. If it raises interest rates, everybody goes bust, including, incidentally, your government. So um, everybody's got a bit sort of stuck on this one, and it's a bit difficult to see the way out. And I think as that situation becomes more apparent to more people, um, the dollar will weaken and I would see gold going better. Yeah, well, I think uh, probably correct. By all appearances, it looks like, like uh, that's exactly what's going to happen. But, you know, uh, I've been wrong enough times before to know that, uh, you know, the world uh, doesn't always follow uh, my expectations, to say the least. <laughs> I'm beginning to think, Kerry, that um, I'm rather like the um, the boy in Aesop's fable who cried wolf. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thought it was yeah. a great joke to begin with. Um, not that I ever thought it was a great joke to say that I think gold is going up, but um, you know, it's the same sort of syndrome. After a while, people don't believe you, and um, then guess what happens? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So I guess we'll leave it at that. 
the Alistair. So uh, where's the best place to find your work these days? Um, goldmoney.com. If you go onto the front page, click under wealth. There's a sort of menu on the top left-hand side. You've got, um, uh, you know, one of them is wealth. And under there, you'll find various research headings. My Thursday article is always published, I suppose, about... Um, midday uh, eastern time um, and that's under insights and i also do a market report on precious metals which i do on friday and that's under market reports i think it's i think it's the sub subheading all right and if you've got any questions comments about this interview or any others that we do email me at kl at kerrylutz.com kl at kerrylutz.com in the show notes we'll have a link over to alistair's work and uh, Alistair, we'll talk to you again real soon. Be well. I look forward to it. Thanks very much, Kerry. Take care. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. not an expert in these matters but that's what it seems to me yeah honored more in the breach than the performance if you will so, yes yes indeed yeah well uh but you know we're to the point now where basically if they can't start doing their jobs we're ripe for a dictatorship it's just going to happen here there, there's no question about it because somebody is going to have to act and if it can't, if they can't act in accordance with the Constitution, then they're going to act outside the Constitution, and and Trump will do it. And whether there'll be an event that gives him the right to seize the reins of power, that's what I always thought Obama was going to do. I thought that's what it was all leading up to. Uh, but that's my guess: is somehow, somewhere, there will be an event that causes him to basically just take over the show, and for better or for worse. I mean, right? All uh, republics uh, have a limited shelf life, and then they devolve into dictatorships. Well, I think there's a problem with that, and that is that, um, well, what we call the deep state um, is definitely anti-Trump. Yeah. And uh, um, I think that they will not permit that to happen. Um I don't know there's a lot they can do about it other than engineer events uh, that undermine his position. And I think they've, they've certainly been trying to do that uh, over his uh, alleged contacts with Russia, which seemed to me to be more in the mind than in, in truth. But I think you're right, Kerry. I mean, basically what we're seeing um, is um, you know what Hayek wrote about in his Road to Serfdom. It's a very progressive drift away from personal freedom um, into less freedom, greater taxation, surveillance. Um, and every time you get a terrorist event or something like that, it's an excuse for yet greater surveillance. We're seeing that over here. Um, it's been with you for some considerable time because what you're thinking, my goodness, uh, is he going to be able to get any of the tax cuts through? What, how, how, is the, how is this going to fit into the budget deficit? Um, and hold on a minute, uh, we're up against the, the lending ceiling or the borrowing ceiling, whatever you like to call it, mm. around about 19, 20 trillion. And that um, the suspension of that was lifted, so they can't go and borrow any more money, as I understand it, until such time as uh, President Trump um, can set a figure and get the agreement of Congress. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I was looking at an article on Zero Hedge this morning that was saying that it's quite possible that government is going to be shutting down from the end of April. So, you know, it's it's um, interesting to say the least. Yeah. Well, I think. Uh, I don't want to call myself a Trump supporter. That's a little too extreme. Uh, I think we were faced with a lot of bad choices or a lot of impossible choices uh, in this election. And he was the time will tell. But the point is uh, <laughs> the corruption and what's happened to the U.S. government here is just stupendous. I mean, they're completely unfit to lead any of them in the Congress. I'm always uh, reminded of uh, Will Rogers' old statement, I'm not a member of any organized political party, I'm a Democrat. Well, now that could apply to the Republicans as well. And the demise of the parties 
I always felt that they should have just been out and out banned, outlawed, because political parties do far more harm than good. And we wouldn't have uh, anywhere near the problems in the world that we have if there were no political parties. I don't know how you go about banning them. I mean, we do have First Amendment here, but I think if the founding fathers knew what was going to happen, they would have outlawed political parties on their own. I think your founding fathers knew what was going to happen, which is why they wrote the Constitution the way they did. I mean, Mm. but basically since then, it has been progressively ignored. At least that's... uh, FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is March 28th, 2017, almost at the end of the first quarter. And we're approaching uh, the first hundred days of the nascent Trump administration. So much going on and figured we'd get the perspective from the other side of the pond. And we've got Alistair McLeod with us now of Gold Money. Alistair, welcome back. It's very much my pleasure, Kerry. Hey, so. (laughs) I wrote an article about uh, Trump, the workaholic in chief. Basically, he's burning out the media because they're, you know, the media, they're basically lazy people that can't wait to get out the door and hit the local watering hole and and really start to work, right? Uh, You're making me sympathize with them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, a story could break out any minute with a tweet and not that you need tweets for uh, for all the news that's been happening lately right i mean you got your share of news over there as well uh, well yes i mean it's it's um, so we've got um uh, brexit will be triggered tomorrow that's um article 50 under which notice is served that we're leaving and it starts a two year process whereby we negotiate the terms of our leaving, as it were. Um, and of course, we've had uh, a terrorist attack, which I mean, I think we've been very lucky not to have had more of those. Um, and it's a bit frightening that anyone who is an extremist behind the, the uh, steering wheel of a car can just go and wipe people out. Um, that is rather worrying. And we just hope there won't be t- any more sort of copycat uh, instances of that. But it's now coming out through WikiLeaks is the most enormous um, uh, control that uh, your uh, intelligence services seem to have over um, electronic media of different sorts. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> there's even sort of fears that uh, they'll be able to turn your fridge on and off. <laughs> so, hey, well, I wrote a, a, anything which is controlled <laughs> by the Internet. Is, <laughs> I wrote a tongue in cheek uh, article a while back. If I didn't, I should have. Is that uh, could your refrigerator refrigerator wind up testifying against you in court, you know, <laughs> or your washing machine or who knows what appliance your television set? Uh, they're all set to uh, spill the beans on you, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, all, <laughs> all, all in record mode. Yeah. <laughs> So hey, all I know is there was a picture of our erstwhile FBI director, James Comey, at his desk and at his computer, he had a piece of tape over the camera. Now, if the FBI director has a piece of tape over his webcam, what does that tell you? <laughs> right. I mean, what what are you supposed to conclude from that? Well, ex- exactly. It tells me that the reason that I have a tape over mine um, <laughs> is fully justified. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I don't over mine. I mean, it's in an office. I don't really spend any time here in the office other than when I am actually working. And at that point, I'm recording anyway. So they get a video of me doing whatever I'm doing. But but it's probably not a bad idea. Sometimes I point it up at the ceiling. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it is a cause for concern. And you know, that, like you said, these people are clueless, but they sure do collect a lot of data uh, they do. in the process of being clueless, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I think I think our only um, defense, or sorry, our, the only benefit, if you like, is they're collecting so much data that they can't possibly sift through it yeah. all. <laughs> Except yeah. what they do is they search for keywords. So you've got to learn what the keywords are and just don't use them. Uh, certainly, um, I think the security services are on high alert, but it's very difficult for them to stop that sort of thing i fear hey there's a fine line between a uh, terrorist behind the wheel 
and at least in Florida, a an 80 year old who can't barely see over the wheel and uh, who has diminished vision and reflexes. I mean, it's hard to tell the difference. <laughs> You know, well, the only thing I can say is that um, I think the elderly parties in Florida don't drive along the pavement at 70 miles an hour. They might drive along the pavement at <laughs> 30 miles an hour, but not 70. But sometimes, you know, they mistake the gas pedal for the brake pedal and then all yeah. bets are off, Alistair. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, yeah, you can't. We've known for a long time that you can't really uh, prevent the majority of these attacks, but so many of them, Alistair, they know these people, they've talked to these people, they've monitored, surveilled them, and even taken away their guns, like here in the United States, only to give them back again, like that chap who shot up uh, Fort Lauderdale Airport. I mean, they know them, and yet they're powerless to do a thing about them. It's just yeah. remarkable. Yeah, it's difficult. Anyway. So, but uh, onto financial terror. <laughs> That's kind of our realm here. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's nothing going on in the world to to make you feel a little bit sanguine or uh, reassured that the powers that be actually know what they're doing and are actually. Uh, on the case, is there? Well, that's right. I mean, I've known for a long time they don't know what they're doing. Um, what I haven't been sure about is whether they're in control of events, which are two rather separate things. I'm beginning to suspect they're not in control of events. And I think this has been shown up, if you like, by uh, uh, your President Trump's experience uh, with um, uh, the Republican Party in Congress over Obamacare, um, trying to repeal that. Hmm. And suddenly, um, you know, we're sitting here.